Prior to Tar, it had been 16 years since we'd last seen a uh, film from Todd Field, who had made the wonderful uh, In the Bedroom, yes. and then Little Children. Um, I wonder uh, if you can talk about just the impression those films made on you earlier in the 21st century, and then what, what, how you became aware of the fact that he wanted to come back to feature films with this project tar, which I believe he said to me, I remember, that I don't think this was going anywhere unless you were gonna be part of it. So that's <laughs> quite a compliment slash pressure on, on you and all of, uh, you know, a lot of people were itching to see another Todd Field film. So yeah. tell, us about, tell us about that. Well, we, we, we met probably about 10, 12 years ago now. Um, he was working with Joan Didion um, on, on a project and for one reason or another that didn't happen, but the conversation that we had with one another was so um, engaged and obviously I'd seen his films and they're so deeply human that he just sort of, you could tell he was placing all of the actors and everyone just into a state of cohesive being. He creates an atmosphere and a world that is, you utterly fall into, and then he pulls the rug out from under you. But you never feel tricked by him, you just feel incredibly disconcerted by his f filmmaking. Um, and so obviously I wanted to work with him. Um, and he's so, uh, such an experimenter as a, as a, as a filmmaker, you know, in, the, in that, in that intervening time, he's been continually experimenting with form and the way he uses cameras and the types of stories that he wants to tell. So it felt when he came back with Tar that he was just coming all guns blazing. And for me, I had never, it was an utterly once in a lifetime experience. And I was, I was saying to him the other day, it is very bittersweet in a way because it's, it's, um, it's been such an incredible experience making the film and then watching the impact that it's had on audiences who've seen it many times, not once, but twice or three times. I was working with Alfonso Cuaron in, in London um, uh, last year and he'd, he'd seen Tar and he said, he said, I've seen it three times. He said, I saw it once and I was I, I just was blown away. He said, the second time, I was envious, and the third time, I went, how the fuck did he do yeah, that? Right. <laughs> it's true. It's very haunting. But, I, like, yeah. A lot of people go back to it and pick up, you know, such subtle things that are in there, like certain sounds even that have been inserted that you make more, that mean something more when you have the context of having seen it once before. Just all kinds of stuff. But I wonder for you, how did you... What did you see as your job with this character? What was what are you um, trying to uh, communicate in playing this woman who she goes through the spectrum of experiences, emotions? Um, I, I can't imagine you're in every scene. I can't imagine you've ever bitten off as much of a an assignment as this would have been for you? Well, sometimes a role, very rarely, hits you at a time when you're open to the sort of the subterranean aspects of what the film is dealing with. I mean, there was so much to do. Um, just to get to first base, to be able to play the character so that the audience would believe that, you know, she had the unassailable right to be there, that she was a master of her craft. And that involved the prosaic things like, um, you know, piano playing and German and conducting and, you know, stick technique and, um, you know, having a musical knowledge and... Um, you learn German for the part. Yeah, it just didn't seem authentic that she would be working at the head of a German orchestra, the intendant, um, the principal conductor, uh, for seven years and then rehearse in English. It just didn't feel right, so... And learn to actually properly conduct I mean there was a there yeah. were musicians who said I, I guess who worked on this who said they you, you would have they would have worked for you in a real world situation <laughs> like that's pretty unbelievable <laughs> but I think maybe where what I knew I was absolutely terrified because we had to do all the music stuff up front and um, I had a pair of jeans a friend of mine who was um, helping me over zoom um, with 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 stick to, Tick, uh, with my stick technique, not my dick technique. Um, <laughs> someone else was with that, sorry. <laughs> I 
no. Well. Uh, anywho. <laughs> and she just said, just remember to plant yourself on the podium. Do not apologize for being there. And she said, well, work from your core. And I thought, that's exactly what I do on the stage. So I wore a pair of um, jeans, which sucked my, I call my tar jeans. Um, and, I, and I just went up there and in my bad German, I, I thanked them for their, for their patience. And I said, we have to rehearse together and we'll find our way together and thank you very much. And then gave the downbeat and we started. Wow. Um, I wonder, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that you and your husband had run this theater company in Sydney, a major place. Did that in any way inform some of the stuff that Lydia Tarr is dealing with as the person who's running a big artistic organization herself? Forget about the Me Too side of things that comes in, but just the power dynamics and the challenges that somebody at the top faces where you gotta keep a lot of people happy, the donors, collaborators, all of that. I mean, I just wonder if that was relevant experience. Yeah, I mean, when you have 250 people, between all the people who work in workshop and administration and, um, you know, in building maintenance, and then you have the creative, um, the, you know, the cast and crews who come, who come through, and then you have, you know, responsibility to your sponsors and to your board, and we were CEOs and artistic directors of the company, so responsible for the fiscal health of the company. I realized how lonely that can be, frankly, that the buck does stop with you and that there will be people who come into your office who you cannot say yes to and that ones that you want to say yes to but you can't because either you, you know they're not quite ready or you just don't have the money to realize their vision or you might be able to program it next year or it doesn't, you've already programmed something else. And so you're always, always disappointing people. And the hard thing is in that situation is to, because often people will get incredibly angry about that stuff. And so there, how do you, how do you it's a, manage those expectations and how do you manage it respectfully? And the interesting thing, which I innately know being in the rehearsal room, is that sometimes rehearsal rooms can be, in order to move through something together, um, they can be um, robust places. And so how do you have that sort of robust and often brutal conversation where you need to kill your darlings, um, but do it respectfully? So they're, they're things that I, I sort of very deeply understood. The way this movie opens is very unusual. We have the... It's a Todd Field film. It's Todd Field, right. Credits. Um, and then this amazing situation, not the, unlike the credits one... Credits rolling backwards, because yes, of course it's really, all about time. Yes. Yeah. And, and then we have you in a situation like this, being, as Lydia Tarr, being interviewed to communicate overtly just what, a, what an accomplished um, and well-known person this is, an EGOT, and they're comparing her to the inside reference to Hilder, who is actually the composer yes, of the film yes, and yes. all of the stuff there, but a lot of subtext as well. And, I, and this is a long um, conversation there where a lot is communicated with you and Adam Gopnik from The New Yorker playing himself. Uh, just can you shed any light on I feel like that what must have been a very complex assignment beyond the fact that it's just a lot of dialogue, right? Yeah, there's a, a, a lot of talk that, in a way, it's, it's incredibly rhythmic, and you realize that you don't, very quickly, you don't need to understand it. You're, there's something disconcerting about it, and I think as the film goes on, you realize that she is one of the world's great classical music performers, but in a way, her greatest performance is herself. And so it was important for me, I think, you know, in a way, in these situations, we try and be as natural as possible. <laughs> but, you know, there's still, there still is an element of performance because if you and I were, were talking, just the two of us, I wouldn't continue to be doing that, knowing that those people over there are gonna get photographs of me going, <laughs> You know, you know, there is an element of self-consciousness to it. And I think certainly there is for um, maestros because their behavior 
um, is often absolutely cements their reputation and an, audi um, an orchestra's expectation about how they might deal with that particular conductor. So it, it was a fascinating, um, we didn't do that scene until sort of halfway through, which I was gra okay. very grateful for. So we kept refining what it was that she was going to, to say. But it sets up a lot of the, the tropes and also you realise, because someone else's her assistant is mouthing her backstory, you, you soon realise that um, she's been running from herself and running from her past, and not in the ways that you think she has. It's a sort of a, an existential running, um, and that, you know, sort of chasing her shadow in a, in a way and manufacturing her identity in order to give herself the space and the access to be able to play the great music which she is, uh, um, you know, a master of. There have been a few real world um, conductors, very famous conductors, who have in the last few years been accused of very bad behavior. As they have of CEOs of major banking corporations. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's not, you know, this is the thing, is it's, it, it could have been set in an architecture firm or, you know, of somewhere on Wall Street or, you know, in Google or wherever, but perhaps that would have been a little more dry and less interesting. But most of them, though, have been men. The idea of having the, uh, uh, basically subverting that, having a um, woman in a way, in a, in a world that outside of tar is still extremely male dominant. I still don't, I don't think there is a, to this day, a female conductor running one of the, however you cl classify that top echelon of, of orchestras, right? They're... No, I mean, it is a fairy tale still. Some of the wonderful Simone Young, my fellow country woman, is, um, she was the intendant of the Hamburg Opera and, and the, the State Opera and the, and the orchestra there, but no, say for example, the Berlin Philharmonic, there's never been a woman. So it's a fairy tale of sorts, absolutely. But this idea then of the woman being the one who's accused of essentially being a quote unquote, you know, or what, what we come to see as like the bad man. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you and or Todd would like that to provoke uh, in terms of the audience to think about things? Is it, is it make it easier maybe for men to reflect on things when it's not I, I guess I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but do you see what I'm saying? Like, is there a strategy to the idea of, of uh, making people think about things differently by... Well, the film is about so yeah. many things. Right. I mean, I, you know, I thought a lot about her turning 50, her summiting her career, and, and as an artist, realizing that once you reach peak, the only way the, creatively is you can't stay up there forever. If you're going to keep evolving as an artist, you have to have failure. And so, you know, she self-immolates in a profound way, in a way, starts again, but, you know, with a different access point to the music, um, you know, itself. But, but yes, I think, you know, if, if that had been a, um, a, a man atop the podium, I think that that's something we would have understood that we see day in, day out. And we would have had a particular relationship, perhaps a safer relationship to um, the examination of power that, that is one element of the film, for sure, yeah. But it wasn't, I, the, the fascinating thing about the responses that the film has had um, that you know exceeded our wildest dreams was that people have been talking about it. Um, I don't think there's any right or wrong way to view the film. And I think that, as you say, when you go back in and see it the second or third time, you, you pick up other different elements. Totally.